Hi there. In this one, I want to talk about HLSL for PCG. This is only available in Unreal 5.5, so make sure that you are working with that version or more recent. I'm going to go to Edit and then Plugins, and we'll make sure that we've got the procedural content generation plugins enabled. Just type in PCG in the search field, and then make sure you've got this one turned on. You may need to do a restart. I'm going to create a blueprint, class actor, call this one BP PCG HLSL. We'll create PCG graph. Call it PCG HLSL demo. We'll create a material and then right click on the material and create a material instance. Go ahead and save everything. Let's open up the blueprint. In the component section, we'll add a PCG component. And then down here a bit, you'll see there's an option for a graph. Drag a graph in. Hit compile and save. Let's go ahead and hide the floor here, just for now. I'm gonna drag the uh, blueprint into the world. And let's go ahead and open up our PCG graph. So I'm gonna right click and type in HLSL. And there'll be three options, custom, point generator, and point processor. The point generator is just going to create points and then give you the option to do whatever you want in the land of HLSL. And the point processor is gonna automatically create an input. So I'll just show you quickly what those look like. And we'll create one more point processor. So you can see really the only difference here is the point processor's got a, a points in already set up. So we'll use that in a second, but I'm gonna scoot it off. Let's open this up by clicking this open source editor. And we'll just take a look at, it's kind of hard to see, but you know, that's life. By default, Unreal is providing a significant amount of functionality that's already added into the HLSL node here. So because it's assuming as a point generator that we're gonna be piping data out, you can see here, we've got a lot of information that we can pass out. So we can set the position, the rotation, the scale, the bounds, the color, and so on and so forth. And then it gives us essentially a function definition here where the data type, in this case, ints and ints and float threes and float fours is included in the definition of the argument. That's important if you want to set this up. Like what kind of data does it expect if you want to set the position of a point? If you have a point processor, it's going to automatically have a section dedicated to the data that's coming in. So you can see in get position, in get rotation, in get scale. Then you can see we have a data index and an element index as an argument. I believe we will see that same thing down here, data index and element index. And one of the main things I want to talk about in this hopefully short tutorial is what is the data index and what is the element index? The element index is actually a lot easier to understand. It's the data index that was a little bit of a challenge for me to unpack. and. Now hopefully I can save you from some of that work. Let's begin by creating a points grid. I'm gonna come down here to the very bottom. You can see there's a create grid 3D and some options. Uh, the one I'm gonna grab here is this one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy it down. And we need to make a float three, call it position. I'm gonna set it equal to this line of code here. Now, it's already been defined in terms of the, the variables or whichever line it was. So we don't need to include, you can see we've got an error. We don't need to include any of that, the int part or the float three part. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of that. We do need to define a min and max. I'm just gonna write 500 and 500, even though it was a float three, it'll go ahead and extrapolate that into a float three. We have num points, that's actually set up here. So 256, whatever, we can make it more interesting. We'll put 2048 and then element index. What that's gonna be is basically the, if you think of this as a for loop, which it essentially is, the element index is what's the index of the point, right? So the first time through, it's gonna be probably zero, maybe one, I'm not sure how it starts counting. Typically it starts at zero and then it goes one, two, three, four, five until we hit 2048 and then it stops. So this will give us the position of our point and now we just need to output it. So we can use this line right here. And once again, we're gonna get rid of all of the data type definitions there. So this just happens to be the same word that was out on accident. You wanna make sure that whatever you're piping in here is the position, if you call it pause or you call it out pause or whatever, 
that's what it's got to be, right? This is the data that we're, we're piping into the out set position function. This right here, this data index needs to have the word out in front of it. I'm going to go ahead and click off and you should see we get an error. And if we look at it, it says use of undeclared identifier data index. So what we're doing here is this is a variable and we need to actually tell it what it is. The reason that we need to put out here is because this word is out. If I change what we call it, which is going to be over here to some other thing, then you'll see all the stuff update. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll just say red. You see now all of these have updated. And now I need to come over here and update this to red. We'll click out, hop back in. There's a problem somewhere. Out set position. This needs to be red set position, right? And if we come over here, let's scoot this out of the way. Which one was it? This guy, I think. I'm going to tap the D key for debug. And there's our points grid. And it's going to be sitting at the origin, most likely. Let's go ahead and do one more thing in the HLSL. I'm going to set the scale. So we'll make a float three. Call it scale. So to define my own float three, all I have to do here, I'm just going to be like 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and 0.2. And then you've got to put a semicolon. Notice semicolons here. Little things like that will trip you up, especially if you're coming from Python like I am. But if I click off of this, where'd my graph go over here? We should see these things. Oh, I've got to, I've got to pipe that data out. So we're just going to come down here to set scale. Go ahead and copy that. All right. My mistake. This needs to be negative 500. Okay, wonderful. So here you can see there's our grid and we are scaling all these points very nicely. So there's a couple little little nuggets in there about how to convert a line like this into functional code and how to define your own variables. Let's move on. To keep this clear, I'm gonna set this back to out and then we'll just update all these things here. What I wanna do now is I'm gonna actually take these points and plug them into, uh, well, first of all, we're gonna copy our actor data. So I'm gonna create a get actor data node. And then we're gonna do copy points. On the actor data node, we need to set the mode to get single point. And then by doing this, what will happen is the points will spawn wherever the blueprint is as opposed to at the origin, which is the default behavior, right? So I've got this custom HLSL node, which is a point processor. I'm going to go ahead and plug in our points. If I hit D, they'll just show up over here where our blueprint is. So what I want to do is I want to create a sphere by removing any points that are beyond a certain distance from the location of our blueprint. Well, let's head over to the blueprint. I'm going to add a variable, call it location. We'll set its data type to a vector, make it public, compile and save. We will pull off a set location node. I'm going to right click and type in the word self. We'll get a reference to self. This will be the actor. Get actor location. And we'll plug it in there. So anytime the blueprint is compiled, which will happen whenever this thing gets moved, this data will update. So now we can easily access it here in the PCG graph by typing get actor property. We need to set the name of the property and what we want to refer to it as here in the graph. I'm going to go ahead and click on my custom HLSL node. And then we're going to add an input. I'll call this one. Actually, we'll just keep it consistent here. Call it location. I'm going to set the allowed type here. Let me expand out just a tiny bit to attribute set. And that is going to be the data that we're getting from our actor property here. Let's go ahead and select the custom HLSL node. 
open the source editor and expand the declarations if it's not already expanded. What we're looking for here is this line. You can see it's got the word attribute name in it as one of the arguments. And since we're dealing with attribute set data, that's going to be the one. I'm going to create a float3 called location. And we'll just set it equal to that line. So even though it's asking for a type argument here, if you put anything there, it'll throw an error. For pin, you can see what the valid pins are, either in or location. In this case, it's going to be location. And then for type, we need to put float3. And you got to make sure that you capitalize this F. For the data index, this is where are our points coming from. That's going to be in data index. We can leave element index alone for now. And then for the attribute name, we just type location. So to test this, what we're going to do is we're going to set all of the output positions of these points to the location of the blueprint. So they should all kind of zero in on that one spot there. So it's going to be out data index in this case. We can leave element index alone. And then the data that we're going to be spitting out will be the location that we're gathering here. Now, when I click off of here, which will basically execute the code, it may at first appear as though everything is going according to plan. But if we scroll around a little bit, we'll notice that it's actually not. We're getting a spray of points kind of all over the place. So what's going on here? Times like this can be very helpful to inspect the data. So what I'm going to do is with my custom HLSL node selected, I'm going to tap the A key, we'll swing down here, and then just expand this out a little bit. And if we look at where the blueprint actually is, 795.262, negative 1, what we can see is that data actually exists on our first input, but then after that, it's all over the place. So what we want to do is rather than using element index, which is going to basically have a unique value for each incoming point, we just want the first points data because this is only one item here. So I'm just going to use zero and we can execute that again. And if we come down and look at this, you will now see that all of the point positions are accurate and sitting there at the location of our blueprint. All right, so now we are reliably getting our blueprint location passed into our HLSL here. Let's go ahead and get the distance from the location to each point. We'll start by getting the position of each point. Set this to in data index and element index. We'll create a float called dist. Set it equal to distance. You see distance turns blue. Distance expects two vectors, two points in the XYZ space. So we have our distance. Let's go ahead and set up an if statement. We'll say if distance is greater than 500, and this needs to go into parens, and then the logic lives inside curly brackets. We'll say density equals zero. And before we can use density, we've got to define it. So we'll set it equal to one by default. Now let's go ahead and pass that density data out. Here we are. And by default, the debug coloration comes from the density. So we'll set this to out data index. All right, let's take a look. So we can see any point that's beyond 500 units from the blueprints location is going to be set to a density of zero. From here, we can just add a point filter. And for the filter, we'll go ahead and use density as target attribute, constant threshold, set that to zero. And I'll just throw a debug in here. So we can see what that looks like. 
All right. So I have one more thing I want to show you, and it involves adding custom inputs and outputs for your HLSL node. So I've set some additional logic up here. Uh, what I have is an add node. And what we're doing is we're taking the position X data and we're adding a thousand to it. And if I turn on debug for this, we get another sphere of points here, a thousand units over an X. And then I have a custom HLSL node. The custom HLSL node has two inputs in O1 and in O2, both set to point data and two outputs, one set to out O1 and the other one is out O2. So when you're using a, an HLSL point processor and it has a default input, it's gonna go ahead and include that in here in its declaration. So there's in, in this case, I've renamed it, but in O1 and out one So if you're gonna add additional inputs and outputs, you've got to declare them down here. So you can just see it's as simple as duplicating this code and just updating what the pin numbers are. I'm gathering the position data. I'm going to offset the position data in Z for both sets of points by 1000. So we're just gonna basically put them up here. And then I'm outputting the new position and setting the first input points, input 01 to red. And then doing the same thing with the second set, except setting it to blue. And there's something that's a little bit squirrely where it's forgetting its scale data. So I'm just restating what I want the scale value to be, which is I think 0.2 here. So if I hop over here and enable this node, we can see we have those points offset a thousand units up and they are red and blue respectively. There's one more thing about HLSO, which is worth pointing out. Uh, this may be a feature that is limited to points that you create with a point generator, but the seed values are going to be identical for every single point. Uh, the seed value is useful for things like density noise, where you're, you're piping in some random number per point and generating a random output. So if they're all the same, it's not really gonna work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add a mutate seed node here. I'm gonna hold control and plunk those guys down in there like that. And now if we inspect this node, again, top the A key, we can see the seed value has been updated with random numbers for every single point. Before I wrap this up, I want to give you a few practical examples of how I used HLSL in this project to perform operations that I think would have been very difficult using the default PCG nodes. Also, the benefit of HLSL is it is executed on the graphics card. So when you have millions of points to process, it can be a significant performance optimization. I'm gonna go ahead and switch in the proxy sphere so things run a little bit more smoothly. So I'll just bring the graph over. There are volumes out here, effectively just cubes, that are positioned in such a way that their boundary dictates where the construction is taking place, right? So the, the location of these volumes here is passed into the PCG graph and converted into point data. So I'll just do some debug in here, right? So we get some point grids, and then I can determine based on the density here, which points are towards the center and which are towards the edge. So I create all of these points that are randomly scaled the ones in the center are scaled a little bit larger than the ones at the edges. Let me release the camera here. So I get this irregular border. The problem is when the points are oriented in world space, they have an irregular collision, strange angles, that kind of stuff with the main points of the sphere. So what I wanted to do was reorient them. So they were all pointing in the direction of effectively the vertical axis here of the sphere. So this is the before, we can hide these temporarily, right? And then this is after they've been oriented. And when they're oriented like this, they make a much more accurate intersection with the surface of the sphere here. So the code is a little bit complicated, basically doing some linear algebra, uh, converting vectors into quaternions because uh, the, the rotation data we have to pass out of HLSL has to be a quaternion. So, you know, I don't know how to do a lot of this stuff. I can conceptually think it through, but in terms of the actual math, I need to refer to uh, ChatGPT. It's very, very helpful for some of these things. So uh, yeah, anyway, I just kind of want to show you one of the many, many situations where I used HLSL to perform an important function that I did not otherwise know how to do using the default PCG scheme. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful. This functionality is, is really, really powerful. And for me, it was uh, it sort of blew the doors open with what I was able to do with PCG. So hopefully you found it useful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below.